Welcome to the One Question Leadership Podcast. This is Chrissy Raywalk, Director of Intercollegiate Athletics at the University of Delaware. One of the things that I appreciate and enjoy most about leadership is that it's a journey, not a destination. It involves lots of different twists and turns, and you need many different types of people to go along with you on your journey in order for it to be successful. So today I invite you to start your leadership journey with this podcast. Enjoy. Greetings, this is Ty Brown and welcome to the One Question Leadership Podcast, where we highlight executive and organizational leadership. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at 1Q Leadership. This episode will be hosted by one of our guest hosts, Kendi Hilliard. Kendi is a student athlete with Illinois State and she's also an intern in the athletics department. Take it away, Kendi. Welcome to the One Question Leadership Podcast. My name is Kendi Hilliard and I'm a current volleyball player at Illinois State University and I will be guest hosting this episode of One Question. On this podcast, I will be featuring Dr. Renee Miles Payne, the current Senior Associate Athletic Director for Administration at the University of Miami. Hi, Dr. Miles Payne, and thank you for coming to talk to me on this podcast. Hi, Kendi. So happy to join you today, and please feel free to call me Renee. Okay, yes, ma'am. So last time we spoke to you on One Question, you were at went through. But now you're at this new role and new position at the University of Miami. Can you tell me a little bit about your duties there? Yes. So um, recently I joined the University of Miami um, in October of uh, 2019 as their Senior Associate Athletic Director for Administration. And so my role pretty much falls into about four buckets, administration, travel, supervision, and culture. And so a little bit about each of those four buckets. So administration is, is the totality of game contracts, policies and procedures, equipment, video services uh, for football. And then travel is I oversee all of the team travel and individual travel for the coaches, chartering planes, getting hotels, and I'm the liaison for our travel company, Anthony Travel. And then sports supervision, I oversee swimming, golf, and diving. And then culture, which is my favorite part of my job, I would say, um, is the pieces where I oversee the strategic planning, professional development, and um, the diversity and inclusion pieces of our athletic department. So that encompasses my job in those four buckets. Wow. So it seems like you're just a busy woman. You're touching on so many subjects of the University of Miami's athletic program, and I love how you mentioned culture. Can you describe a little bit about how Miami's culture is different from other schools? Yeah, so it's funny. I think most people have always had that probably love-hate relationship with the University of Miami from the previous days of being that school um, that invented swag, the championship days, and the football student-athletes who have gone on to the NFL, I think at, uh, Miami ranks in the top two. They're one or two um, nationally with the most NFL drafts. And so it is the culture of, you know, we're the greatest, we're the best. And you come in and you're involved in that culture immediately and endowed in that culture because a lot of the former players are around often. Um, they work out there. They, they, they involve themselves in what we're doing in the community, and, and they stay connected to the program. And so part of my job is to make sure that that culture is seeped into not just the football program, but also into the uh, staff side of, of things. So you can have it on the sports side, but sometimes the staff kind of get goes missing a little bit. And so part of my role is to help um, infuse that culture within the entire the entire staff and to uh, maintain that sense of I say swag or or high level of competition even with the athletic administrators. So as we talk about the swagger and the new thought processes and implementing it into this new day and age but what are some of your thoughts on bringing back student athletes during COVID-19 and what are some restrictions and challenges you're going through now? as you bring those student athletes back? Yeah, so one of the things that hits me differently than some of my other colleagues is 
understanding that, you know, COVID-19 is affecting the minority population at a greater level than others. And so we're making certain that our plan in in its totality it's also making sure that we're touching on the areas that will affect the student athletes of color a little bit, you know, differently. And so we're, you know, beefing up the the, the level uh, of, of security and, and, and health concern in those spaces that need to be, you know, in increase. So in the sports of, you know, football, and men's basketball, um, there's a very high level of concern from parents and sometimes the student athletes themselves about what are going to be the protocols specifically to, for me to make sure that I'm, I am protected. And so we're taking a very um, close look at how we do that and making certain that when they do come, that they feel that they have the, the utmost protection um, they feel as safe as they possibly could be, and that they are also adhering to the, the, the protocols that we're putting in place. And that is not just for the minority student athletes, all, all student athletes, but specifically making sure that the minority student athletes do feel that a, a amount of care has been put into the plan to, to protect them at a greater level. I know how you put an emphasis on the people of color and just giving them equal opportunity. And I know that you're also a board of director for MOA. Can you clarify what the organization is and like what are some of its benefits? Yeah, so essentially MOA is an organization that is an umbrella organization that advocates for people of color in athletic administration um, for student athletes and coaches alike. It's that one organization that still exists um, where people of color can point to as a voice of reason, as a, as a national voice of reason um, and issues that affect us specifically. And so um, you talked about some of the benefits, you know, being, being a part of MOA um, is, you know, you get to work on committees. I, I, I joke with some of our younger members in the organization that if they decide to work on a committee with the MOA, it helps them be ready to work on a committee at the NCAA level. And they probably are working a little bit harder in MOA, actually. And we provide scholarships and we provide uh, grants for professionals. And a lot of times the only grants or scholarships that most people get are, are just coming out of college. Um, but we are doing it for people who are already professionals, who are already sitting in a chair uh, or a seat in an athletic administration position and need assistance with going back and getting that master's degree or that doctorate degree. Um, or you need a grant or you need financial assistance to um, do some professional development over the course of, of a year. So we provide tangible benefits like that. We, we provide awards. Um, my, my, the former president of Winthrop, um, my, you know, former boss actually just received an award from MOA last week, um, as a Charlie Whitcomb service award winner. So we, we identify and give out awards to people who are advancing the mission of diversity and inclusion throughout, um, throughout the NCAA, NAIA, collegiate athletics in general. Um, educational opportunities like Last week, we hosted our symposium. We have webinars all through the year that are open to members, and and we also open it up to non-members sometimes. And career opportunities. We get calls. Several of us on the board or our executive director, Stan Johnson, will get a call from from a president or an administrator in the business who are looking for candidates who fit a job description that they have and want to make sure that their position is inclusive and has minority candidates applying for it. So we are seen as kind of that one-stop shop for people who want to, to become part of the, the organization and, um, and can have a place where they know that they can get a voice uh, on the national stage. Great. Well, I'm a little upset that there's not a student athlete version, or if there is, I need to join it. <laughs> 
Okay. Well, see, now you've got you you've given you give me an idea. We actually do have a student version of membership that we're working that we're working through, and so you will do be the first person that I make sure to get that information, Candy. I love that. I love that. Look at you looking out for me. <laughs> of course, of course. Has MOA made a statement regarding the so the recent climate of social injustice and racism in America? Yeah, we did. We posted it on on Twitter um, a couple of weeks ago, right as the tensions um, began to, to rise after the George Floyd murder. And I would say that we, we our statement was probably a little different than most, as we were more prescriptive in how we wanted our allies and institutions around the country to look at what they do next. And so out of the frustration, after the anger, after the hurt, what is it that we need to do to move, you know, to move forward? And so some of the things people had already started doing, um, but some things we thought needed to be probably said and stated. So, yes, you know, conduct your wellness checks on the student athletes and the staff and make sure that they, you know, they're okay. Make sure you're providing a safe space for student athletes and staff to, to have this dialogue of what's going on in, in, in the country. Um, one of the things I really like is being an active listener. So everybody has said, okay, you know, we need to listen. We need to listen. Yeah, I want to make sure you are an active listener because if I'm asking you to be an active listener, you are actually using all of your senses to sit and hear what I'm saying. And then you're prepared to go out and do something um, to, 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 to help be part of the solution. You call out the colleagues that are, that are saying things that are not good. If they have any you know, stereotypical beliefs and they make them known openly, be that person who stops them and says, well, hey, you know, that may not be okay. I have a colleague who, who may not dance or, you know, have any, you know, any of the beliefs that you are, you're saying right now that, that might be stereotyped. Call out the discriminatory actions that are in policies within, within departments. Um, and you can't, you know, as someone says, you can't cure everything but you can be an active change agent where you are. And so do your part. And when everybody does their part, the change becomes real and relevant. And so we have put out that and we are having conversations with athletic directors and, and administrators across the country asking, you know, what is it, you know, that I, that I can do? What is it that can, we can do? Um, make sure that you something that has recently just passed legislation within the NCAA that some athletic departments probably haven't done but should be getting ready to do as of August 1st is to designate your chief diversity officer and then make sure that they are empowered to do the job. Because it's one thing to have a chief diversity officer or a person designated to work on diversity and inclusion issues within your department, but then they're not empowered to do the work. But I think after this George Floyd incident, everything has had an uptick on the level of empowerment and responsibility that folks that do this kind of work uh, have. And so excited to, to, get, to get to work and have those types of conversations and discussions with colleagues across the nation. So you have this method of how to approach the social injustice with your colleagues around. Have you always used this method in if so, has it changed since you moved to Miami and how are y'all addressing it at Miami? Yeah, I think you have to be cognizant of everywhere you go, you may have to adjust your messaging. So I'll give you an example. As, as I got the job at Winthrop, I was the COO, Chief Operating Officer, so the number two to the athletic director. And I, had, I asked him to read a book before I began my job. And the name of that book was White Like Me by Tim Wise. And I wanted him to read that book so he had a full 
understanding of the privilege that he had as a white male in his role as not just an athletic director, but is in, in, in society. And so how he could use that to be uh, impactful for people of color, impactful for the people in his sphere that he, that he touched. And so we began to do, have these conversations, these very real conversations, and it had helped our relationship immensely. At the, I did that from the very on, on, on site of me be, of starting there. And so it was helpful for him to see me knowing that I was going to always be honest and forthright with him, no matter what the situation was. So that, that set the stage for how we moved and operated within that a- athletic department at Winthrop. And when we did our strategic plan, which I helped lead and steer, the first letter in our strategic plan, um, the, the acronym was DRIVE, and the first letter was diversity. D stood for diversity. Moving from there to, 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 to Miami, I've been here for about nine months, and a lot has happened. You got COVID-19, you got uh, um, this, the, the, the current climate of, of the George Floyd murder and all of that. And so it's kind of switched how I've had to, to have these dialogues. You first come into a job, I'm not the number two to the athletic director. I sit on the senior leadership uh, staff and do have a voice and do use it. But now I have to make certain that what I'm doing is also relating to what the, de- the, the deputy ADs want to see and want, want done, as well as the athletic director. So there's just one layer to my work and how I move forward. And so similar things will begin to happen now because of the climate. Things changed. Now I might not have to move as slow as I was before. It's sped up a little bit. So we have to implement some things faster than it would be if I had a, had a full year in to assess everything, to see everyone, to talk to all of my colleagues, to get to know every coach um, and how they move and how they operate. I don't have that kind of time now. Now I have to be very pres- prescriptive right now and do the things that's necessary to catch to, you know, to catch us up with what everyone else is doing in, in the nation because of the current climate. So I went with I had time, and now I don't. <laughs> <laughs> that was such a great answer. And I know from, like, speaking to several other student athletes that, like, we just don't think about things that happen at a, an administration world or administration industry and how fast it goes because we only see it from – our perspective so I love hearing it from your perspective and like the change of pace because to me that's similar to like moving moving from high school volleyball to college volleyball it's a total different change and I appreciate that answer and I just have a question about like you prioritize op- promoting opportunities for people of color why did you choose that as your emphasis on moving up in your career literally I'm just simply paying it for it People helped me, and now I'm in a position to help others. I always said that if I ever get in a position of influence, trust and believe, I'm going to be influential. And I know there are people um, behind me, coming behind me in these roles, who need the guidance that I, that I was given. You know, in all transparency, you know, Kendi, I, I wasn't the easiest person to guide because I started out kind of sometimes knowing, thought I knew, you know, knew it all and knew everything. But there were people in my corner who saw that I could be good at this and did not give up on me and continue to prune me in a way to help me grow and to keep saying, no, Renee, you need to kind of go this way. And, and I'll give you an example. Um, I, the role of the symposium chair for MOA, for instance, I've had that chair position about four, maybe five years now. And um, the person who had it before me, 
is a legend in this business. Her name is Alfreda Goff. And Alfreda Goff, to my not, to, I, I didn't know this, had been watching me since 2011 when I got on her committee and I was outspoken and I would say things and she would just help me say it differently, help me say it in a way where people could digest it and, and, could, and could hear it. So because I listened, and I listen, and that's one of the things I tell you, you know, young administrators now, you have to be coachable. You did not join a team and automatically was an NCAA All-American. <laughs> you had to be coachable to get to that spot. So be coachable as an administrator as well. And so I was coachable. I heard her when she said, do it differently. And it helped me be better. And it also helped her determine who her successor was going to be when she stepped away from being the chair of the symposium. And there's only been two, Alfreda Goff and myself. Wow. That history. And I'm like super proud to know you as a person and as a friend. And I'm excited to learn more about Oh, that is so cool. About what you do and like Moa and everything. As long as you're coachable, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Of course. And so like as a woman and especially a woman in co of color, what have been some challenges that you face navigating this male dominated industry? There's a quote by Marianne Williamson um, from the book Return to Love. It says, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We are born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just in some of us, it is in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. That quote is what I repeat when I get in a situation where the challenge of dealing with men in this profession kind of gets me down sometimes you know this is a male dominant profession and I chose it and at, at every point you have to tell yourself that it's male dominant you already know that and you chose to operate in this male dominant profession so the likelihood of you experiencing a staff member or a coach that doesn't want to report to a woman uh is likely inappropriate comments you know, in a meeting to make you feel uncomfortable on purpose, likely. You know, your light shining brighter than maybe your male counterpart or your boss, likely. So you you must know that that is, is going to be a part of it. But you don't dim your light still because that's might, that might happen. You continue to shine and continue to encourage the other people around you to shine with you. I consider it the halo effect. You know, if, if there's a positive impression about me somewhere in this world, because I work with you, there's a positive influence about you and the institution and everybody who works here. So it's a, it's a, use it as a halo effect. And that's what I do. I know there's challenges there, but I, I don't dwell on it. I don't worry about it. I just keep moving. I keep knowing that I'm powerful. Expect the unexpected that'll come and then keep shining. And that's why I encourage all the women every time I talk to, you know, young ladies who may be going through some issues at work with their male counterpart. That's what I encourage them to do. Read Marianne Williamson and keep shining. Wow. I, 
I'm speechless. I just feel like I just want to run through a brick wall now. You just hyped me up and boosted my my confidence. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's right. That's what this ain't this ain't that's what the one question for. Ain't that's what Ty brought you, you know what I'm saying, here to do. We get encouraging encouraging women around the world. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay. For All my right, for my go. for my last <laughs> question. Um, what advice do you have for me to ensure a successful transition from playing to then working in college athletics? What you're doing right now is amazing. I wish I had done it. I probably was further along in my career by now if I had done that. I mean, I was a former student athlete too, and I just didn't think about the opportunities to move forward and do college administration at that, at that time. Um, but yeah, what you're doing right now is amazing. And I would also encourage you to study the profession, study the profession and the people in it. Um, I mean, I did my dissertation on this profession, you know, so studying this profession and the people in it is key. You know, identify a male and female administrator that speaks to your experience and the path that you want to take. And be consistent in reaching out to them. I know your 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 aunt, Dr. Janice Hilliard, who was a mentor to me coming coming up. She was one of those people that I looked up to and, and that saw something good in me and helped me shape it. So I so I'm in a position that I am today. And so you start you know, you're starting early enough to identify those um male and female administrators that, that speak to you. Um, and then properly manage your social media because you're still in an age where you're going to do things. You're, you're, you know, life is cool and life is fun and there'll be things that you'll want to do and post because that's your guys's life. That's the, that's your culture. That's what you do. I would just say properly manage it. So when you're 25 and you're looking for that first job, they won't have what you did when you was 21 sticking up in their, in their face because it doesn't match. It's not inappropriate. It's inappropriate for uh, a person in your, you know, in your position now. So uh, properly managing your social media would be, would be another key area that I would suggest. Thank you so much for the advice. And I have, I'm so honored to learn from you today and continue to learn from from you in the future and I'm also ecstatic that we're both we're sorority sisters in the Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated. Yes. And <laughs> yep. And I'm just super honored that I got you on the podcast today. So thank you for coming on. That's awesome. I appreciate the I definitely appreciate the opportunity and 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 you working with Ty and everything that you guys are doing is awesome and continuing to develop and inspire people uh, in this profession. I thank you for it. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for tuning in. And as always, I'm Kendi Hilliard and go you Redbirds. This episode of the One Question Leadership Podcast is produced by Spades Media Group. Solving problems using creative leadership.